Salutations, respected viewers. This is George from Ireland. So here I am um, in front of Joseph Conrad's house in London. So I'm in the, the Pimlico area, not far from uh, Victoria Station. One of my dear fans was saying, could you please be more precise about your location? Anyway, so uh, Joseph Conrad um, was a novelist who was born in what's now Ukraine in 1857. Um, it was then part of the Russian Empire. He was Polish. A lot of the other Polish ethnicity were living there at the time. There are almost none of them there these days um, because Poland's borders had waxed and waned like those of other countries. At one time, there was the Polish, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth from the um, 15th to the 18th century. It was quite mighty, ruled from the Baltic to the Black Sea and included much of what's now Ukraine. So his mother tongue was Polish and there was never any doubt in his mind that he was Polish even though he was an, a reluctant subject of the uh, Russian Empire. But uh, he went to sea at an early age. He spent a lot of time in France. French was his second language. I'm not sure if he ever learned Russian, actually, although that wouldn't be that difficult for a Pole. And he spent some time in the United Kingdom, and he acquired almost flawless mastery of uh, the English language, and then he began to write novels. Um, so far as I know, he only ever penned his novels um, in the English tongue. Um, so, they like Lord Jim, for example, this typhoon under Western eyes. Some of these are secret uh, service novels that seem to be um, foreshadowing Ian Fleming. There's The Secret Agent um, about um, Agent Provocateur. And a lot of that was going on here because the United Kingdom with its traditions of, of, of freedom of expression became a magnet for um, revolutionists from around Europe, from Poland, from Russia, from Germany, from Italy uh, and other countries. And they congregated here and they met them. But of course, foreign governments like Tsarist Russia didn't like this. And the idea is that uh, wouldn't they like to encourage, provoke uh, these uh, revolutionaries here to set up a bomb or something like that, really upset the British government, have them booted out. That's the premise of one of his novels. And um, he, he wrote this secret agent one shortly after Greenwich was designated the home of time. Greenwich here in London, because up until, up until the late 19th century, well, time was a local thing. Um, it was each up to each village to set its clock and decide what the time was according to where the sun was. So in one village it might be five minutes past noon. In a village uh, ten miles away they might consider it half past noon. Because you, you just made it up. Because nothing could travel faster than a galloping horse. So this didn't matter much until the mid-19th century. Even horse-drawn coaches weren't that fast. You know, it, it would take like about 24 hours to get from London from Oxford to, from London to Oxford in the, in the 18th century, if you're lucky. Um, but then the railways changed all that because they had to have timetables. So for the timetable to make any sense, we all had to be on the same page about what time it is. Um, but obviously we know that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, and we can't have the same time all over the world. Otherwise, midnight would be when it's blazing sunshine in some parts of the world, or midday, it would be when it's completely dark in other parts of the world. So we had to, we had to differentiate it um, and have different time zones. So where was going to be the prime meridian? Where was the zero line going to go through? Even the ancient Greeks had this idea of a meridian, but not in relation to time zones. Um, and there's a big international conference. It could have been Paris, but they opted for London. Greenwich. Why Greenwich in particular? Because there was the Royal Observatory there and the Royal Naval College. And obviously studying the stars was very important for navigation. This is long before SatNav and TomTom and all the rest of it. No global positioning system till the late 1980s. Um, and so sea captains had to be able to do that. Even today, apparently they do, just in case everything else broke down. Um, so if, but if you blow up uh, this observatory, um, and that would really strike at the British bourgeoisie who were like precision and their, and their clocks and their watches and time was becoming more important, time is money. Remember we used to have a watch and chain, it became a wrist watch in the Americans event of that civil war. So that's, that's one of his novels. Um, and uh, he occasionally um, slipped up and there was um, second language interference, not first language interference that I noticed saying things in the French manner saying, a man is, was in pass of being a pianist or something, rather than he was becoming a pianist. Saying in the French manner, you don't actually say it that way in English. But apart from that, he's a superb stylist, incredibly uh, descriptive, can vivify seemingly banal scenes. Um, what else about uh, Joseph Conrad? So he became a naturalized Britisher. Um, and uh, when, the, when the First World War broke out, uh, he was a partisan of the Entente, which is perhaps surprising because um, Poland was going to be a battleground. Poles was contributing to the German army, the Austrian army, the Russian army, and that was that. 
and so a lot of them were going to be killed, whatever happened. And some, some, some polls regarded Russia as the real enemy. The, the, the Austrian rule was relatively beneficent, German rule wasn't as bad, and Russia was the worst. And Poland was never going to get independence until the defeat of, of um, Germany. I won't go into that too much. Anyway, he was a good friend of, of Sir Roger Casement, that chap who exposed um, abuses in the Congo Free State. But when he discovered that Casement had become a German agent, um, Conrad disowned him, was absolutely irate. He could not forgive such a betrayal and obviously Casement was sent to the gallows. Conrad could have signed the letter asking for a reprieve, but he refused to do so. Anyway, he died uh, in 1924. That is Joseph Conrad.